to know more information, you know, not just what our commitments are, who are we spending money with, what contracts have been let already, so of our budget, how much is actually committed to the clients, what's still unawarded, you know, we know, you know, known scope that we haven't awarded yet, you know, what has got funding, what hasn't got funding. Um, if we haven't got funding approved, when are we going to get the funding? Who's going to give it to us? Um, contingency, I tend to find now, is not just managed with one pot. So I used to find on a major capital project, you just had contingency and it was a huge pot of money and you draw that to wherever it was needed. Now we tend to find that each part of scope will have a discretionary amount called contingency that can be let down by you know, the, the person that owns that um, at their discretion. People want to understand what risks they predict, what risks have been realised, what risks are you know, therefore left. Um, because we're seeing contract management, a lot of companies now are, it's no longer sort of fixed price contracts, they're no more brutal contracts from owners that penalise contractors. There's a lot more pain and gain type contracts now where, you know, if we budget for 100,000 and it costs us 80, we're going to share that, you know, that 20,000 win between us. Equally, if the contract runs over, then we're going to share, you know, the, the overrun. So both parties want to have a better understanding of pain and gain predictions. As this picture changes, the point is here, any status change, if we award funding, if we award money to a contract, even though we're not creating anything different, we're changing status, all of that is considered a change and has to be signed off by the relevant parties. And what that means is volume. Now, I've seen capital projects over $10 billion where over their whole five, six, seven year life cycle, they'll go through a few hundred, 1,500 changes over that whole life cycle. And that's because scope changes are... What I said here, you know, that they're just scope changes, that that's the only kind of change we have, or contingency drawdowns for known events when they occur. Um, what I've seen here now um, recently is that where you're doing contract management, you can have 2,000 changes a period. You know, so every month you're doing the same amount of changes as a project of the same size would have done over five years. And that means there's a huge amount of volume, huge amounts of signatures, huge amounts of scope for going wrong. Things to consider. Now, this... Up to now, I'll say as well, including this bit, when you're doing change, you know, there are a few questions you need to consider. Um, quite frankly, you, know, you can do this. Um, you know, this isn't a system thing. This is just a, you know, what you need to consider if you're going to get it right and get all the right signatures. First thing to do is, well, what are you gonna, where are you going to manage your change? Well, this is my problem with white space and external registers. What you're normally doing is you're taking a set of objects normally held in your cost management system, you know, your control accounts, your CTRs, your cost objects, and you put another set of data, which is exactly the same, in your change log, your Excel spreadsheet, your access database. And you make your changes in here, and when you've done that and updated them, remember to update it, you go back and you import them into where they lived in the first place. So the natural place to manage change, rather than sort of making replicas and trying to reconcile data all the time, is just put the changes where your original data exists. So the objects we're changing live in the cost management system, so it's a natural place to manage change as well. Then you think, what are we changing? Um, so we're not just changing sort of scope, we're changing our budget, you know, our original budget or our current control budget. We might be changing our forecast. You know, most companies try and have you know, a number of baselines. You have your original budget, your current budget, your estimate at completion, your predicted or, or um, potential estimate at completion. You might also want to look at things like risk, funding, so you understand your know, project funding you know, coming from the business. What types of changes are we managing? Again, it's not just scope changes now. It can be trends, those early warnings, um, you know, raising a flag. It may never happen, but I'm raising a flag. I'm standing in water. I didn't expect that, so I'm raising a flag. This could cost us money. Transfers, just moving money around. Contract events, if we're doing contract management, any contract award or a descope or a rescope or a change to scope um, could be a contract event. We also need to do top-down budgeting. Most projects these days, because there's so much money involved, they don't have the money stuffed under a mattress. They, you know, Crossrail, the money is made available when it's needed. So if we don't need a billion till you know, 2014, that's when it'll be available. Most companies, you know, when they're doing the projects, will look at the project cost curve and make sure the money's available. They act like a bank. But if it's not needed for five years, they'll spend it somewhere else and make a return on it in the meantime. So sometimes you have to draw money down from the business, from the program, into the project so that you, so it's available where it's needed, when it's needed. Who would initiate change? Is it anybody? Is it free for all? Actually, the solution I've got says anybody could initiate change because if the right people are signing, it just won't get signed. Um, but normally, 
the person that signs the change is someone that's sort of qualified to do so, that understands what the change is, understands how much you know, money is required and what the scope is. Um, normally, therefore, it's sort of someone like the cost engineer who will own those objects, you know, that they're responsible for delivering that scope of work. But that's just not initiating change. So I need the money, but I'm not going to, you know, I can't self-sign. So who's then going to sort of confirm that I've put the right values in, that the scope is genuinely, you know, a, uh, an issue? So who's going to review the change details, both from a, um, a quantity and a qualitative point of view? Well, normally there, there are a number of subject matters, so experts. So a change, you might say, well, is the value right? Well, let's look at the contract information. Let's look at what the estimator says. Um, what about the, you know, the, the proposed fix or the changes? You know, let's look at the estimators. Let's look at the engineering teams. What about any changes to, to schedule? Well, let's talk to the planners about that. Um, other people that should um, review changes are people that own the objects we're changing. So if I'm transferring money from me to you, it shouldn't just be me that reviews it, it should be you. If I'm spreading money between a number of people here in your control accounts, you should all get a chance to say yes or no, or to at least understand the impact of that. Um, other people that should review changes are people that are, you know, could potentially sign the change but don't have the authority. So quite often we find project managers can do some sort of signatory. Um, an area manager might have sign-off. But if the value is beyond them, then they, they don't get to do it, so they get to say... You know, they get to confirm and know that it's okay, but they don't necessarily get, they can't say yes, but they should get to review it. So finally, who should approve these changes? Finally, um, you know, what you need here is it can't just be, you know, one of us because we feel like it. It has to be somebody that's actually got the authority. And companies are getting extremely strict on who has financial authority to sign a change and to what value. Finally, um, what process would we use for change approval? Now, there are lots of different ways of approaching this. So at the moment, if you're using paper, you might say, well, I'm going to have to go around and find each individual and go, can you sign this, can you sign this? Well, leave it with me, I'm going to have to review it. Um, and I might have to go in order. Sometimes you'll send out the same email to everybody, and as long as everybody signs it, we don't care. As long as I get eight bits of paper with eight signatures on, I'll staple them together, and there's all my you know, big floppy sort of fan of signatures. Um, and it really depends on you know, what you're changing and what your process is like and, and how restricted you are. And I've got a few examples now. They all use exactly the same change value. It's all 1.2 million just because I had a slide that, that lends itself to that. So I've been lazy and replicated that a few times. Um, but there's different types of change. And again, you'll probably find you use one or more of these depending on what the type of change is. It might be value-driven. You might say, well, you know, anyone can do it less than 100,000, but if it's over a billion, it has to go to the board. So the first one is what we call a simple review and approve. I can send these to you afterwards. You don't want to read all this. Basically, it always works the same way. If it's 1.2 million, for example, you move the dots either way, um, then anybody that hasn't got approval should look at it. Anybody that's a subject matter expert that's impacted by it should look at it. And they should be able to say, you know, yeah, I agree with that, or no, hang on, this is wrong. They should be able to sort of stop it as soon as they can. But then the first person that's got financial authority will sign it. Um, the way this works is you'll often say, well, we don't care who signs, as long as someone from finance and someone from delivery looks, I don't care. Or as long as we've got an estimator, a planner, and a project manager signing it, we don't care. Um, so the way this kind of works is we have, for this year, we've identified a number of people that could review this. We've identified the person that's got the sign-off authority for 1.2 billion. And in this case, um, as long as we get one of these signatures, we don't care if it's four, one, two, three, or six, or five, um, as long as you get one of those, then it's considered signed as long as the approver's already signed it. We see it otherwise where someone say, well, no, we need all those signatures. I don't care what order. So we do exactly the same order, but all the approvers and reviewers have to get, you know, this is where you need all the signatures. You know, it doesn't matter what order. You know, if the guy that approves it first is, you know, that's fine, but as long as everyone else signs it. So in this case, you need all the signatures. We don't care what order it goes in. So it can start here and go through here. It can start here and go, you know, it doesn't matter if the approver's first, last, or in the middle of that chain. And that's how a lot of companies work now. What you tend to find, though, if you look at scrutinise it closely enough, you know, people have been missed. You know, this is where you find that things are missing. I mean, I only drew a line, and I think I missed some. <laughs> What we're finding more and more is companies say, well, we have to do things in sequence. We have to actually drive things in a certain direction. And there's a good reason for that. Um, it's the same thing, reviewed by subject matter um, experts, with um, 
and then by reviewed by them and then by an approver. So this one, um, everything has to happen in sequence. And the reason we do this, and I'll just show you how it looks, it's the same change. It's still 1.2 billion. It's the same people. But now it goes through a very specific order. So it will only go to reviewer number two when reviewer number one has looked at it. So it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, and then to your approver. And the reason we do this is because there's some sanity here. This is probably the cost engineer who understands the bit of work the best. This might be his project manager. Then you've got somebody else, maybe the planner. You know, they have no financial authority. I've drawn a line here where you've got no authority. So they can never say yes, but they should always be consulted because they understand the body of work. And then it goes up and up and up. And if this guy could sign it, if it was less than a million, he'd sign it and approve it. But because it's over a million, it has to go to this person here for 25 million for the approver. Now, the reason we do it in this order is so that the person at the top um, has some assurance. You know, they, the first thing this guy is going to do, if it just comes to him, is, oh, who's looked at it? I don't know what this is. I sit in a skyscraper. I'm not down in you know, a coal face or a ditch. Um, so I actually want to know that these guys have looked at it because this gives me a sanity check. So the sensible thing to do is get it looked at by all the subject matter people. If it goes wrong, it goes wrong early and it gets nipped in the bud. And this guy, who could be the board, doesn't have to be a person. So the board can actually say, you know, it doesn't get to them until we have a very, very high level of probability that this is real. So this is a really sensible way of doing things. You can do the same with multiple budgets because most times you're not just, if you're raising a trend, you might just be changing, you know, one budget. But actually, you know, if it's late delivery, you might say, well, it's just affecting our, you know, um, our top side budget. But if you're doing multiple budgets, a lot of changes impact more than one budget. And the point here is you have exactly the same thing for our delivery, but if in finance is involved, if we've also got to match the delivery by our finance, you know, by our project funding, you'll probably find different people own funding. It'll be finance, it'll be project accountants. It's nothing to do with the delivery guys. They can't say yes to finance. So for the same change, we have a separate in parallel funding change where the values can be different, the people are different. You know, in this case, this guy can approve it because he's got 1.25 million. This guy's not required, he doesn't get involved. So in this case, we have two separate, and only when we've got all the signatures and both people of the approvers have said yes, is that change considered difficult. Now this is complicated, this is real, but it's complicated with a pen and paper. One point to make here is that with things like this, sometimes, although you have these two levels, well you could have three, you could have four, you, know, you often find the more lines you cross, you end up with more and more strings. So if we're moving money from one project to another, all the project managers get to involved, you know, and the project director. So, you know, these happen in parallel. Um, you might find sometimes that they actually converge again at the top because if you go high enough, someone can say yes. If you go to the board, the board says, well, I look at both of those, so I can just sign both sides of it. You don't have two separate approvers. Finally, transfers, exactly the same here. One thing to think about transfers is um, people fall through the gap and say, well, we're not doing anything. It, it nets to zero. We're not creating anything. You know, the, the overall paper value is zero, but actually a transfer could be is one or more, is two or more transactions that equal zero. So if I'm giving one of you a million pounds, that's actually two transactions. I'm giving you a million. That needs to be signed off by the person with the million approval, and you need to sign it you know, because you're receiving a million. So it's actually two transactions in parallel. So we have exactly the same transaction again, and we have exactly you know, a mirror image on the other side. The difference here is you've got, you know, this first one is for a positive transaction of 1.2. This one is a negative 1.2. And again, these fall through the hole because, you know, only one sign, this guy signs it. And they say, well, I've done the tra transfer. No, you haven't. You transferred it out, but they haven't said yes. So you need both sides of that equation um, signed. The transaction can impact zero, but actually what we've got two is two high value 1.2 million pound transactions. Again, quite often, if you go high enough, somebody can say yes to both sides of that equation. I've got conclusions. I've got two screens just showing you how this could be approached in a software package. Again, you could do this in an Excel spreadsheet. But all I want to show you here is you know, a typical sort of change management system where you define what the change is, and then what you need to do is say, well, what, this is our change. It's this type of change, and this is where it's impacting. So down here, we select these cost objects, these control accounts. So here I've got two control accounts. And then I'd say, well, what am I changing the values of? So it's these control accounts, I'm actually doing a negative 1.2 million here and a positive 1.2 million here. And I'm changing my budget and my financial budget. So I'm moving money and the financial budget, the funding side of it. It nets to zero. 
we're doing it in sequence. So that's quite straightforward. All we're doing, I mean, without all the noise around it, we're doing, two, we're doing a transfer of 1.2 million. So this is how you have to define it. Though. Two sides, two sides to the equation. The way it gets defined is you then click a button and you get an approval list of people. And the way this works is you first of all get a hierarchical approval sequence. Because we said in sequence, so it goes from the lowest level, um, you know, the people that own the changes that should say no or yes straight away. I didn't ask for that. Um, the cost engineers, because they might actually understand the body of work. And then say the project managers, the area managers, the delivery managers, the accountants, because there's a finance element in here, so they need to be consulted. And ultimately, because of the value, it's gone to the board. So we have this heart, but it will never get to the board if these guys don't all say yes on the way. I can see here who's an approver, a reviewer, and who's an approver. So this first group of people are all reviewers. So that's their role, and it will go from one to two to three to four, etc., etc. Once it gets to the next group of people, there are approvers. Now, in this case, it's the board, so they can approve both sides of it. But again, you know, these are roles, but these could be, with the exception of the board, different people. As we go through it, we can see the status, so we understand where it is, not you know, who's in tracing. It means I know how long someone's had to change. I can go and chase them up. We think here, I'll talk about the benefits in a minute, but you know, we know status, we know whose court the ball is in, um, and we can go and you know, progress this change. And this is complex. This is difficult enough to work out you know, without some help. The benefits of this are, well, benefits are subjective. It depends who you are. You know, some people might say, I get to do more work, or I get to go home early. Um, businesses tend to say, well, we get better data integrity. You know, we can survive an audit. Um, one of the things to say as well is that you get automatic status updates because it's not that I wait for you to sign it, you tell me, and I'll go and update my system, and then you pass it to so-and-so. Uh, sorry, I'm not calling you so-and-so. Um, but you pass it to the next person, they sign it, they tell me I update the system when I remember to, but it's period end, so it'll probably be next week when I do it. There's none of that, so it's not, we're, we're totally in sync. So as soon as you sign it, you know, we know it's signed because you know, your act of signature is done in an application like this. So we get automatic progress, status update. We get rid of those static data, the, those um, white spaces, those separate registers that I'm sure most of you have or have seen in your lives. So we get rid of that separate set of data that's completely disconnected and, and at odds often with what your base set of data is. We get adherence process. You can't break the rules like this because suddenly you know, everyone knows what you're doing, make sure you know, everything's done right. If there's a signature missing, it's just not approved. Um, you know, approval is not subjective, it becomes incredibly objective and it's based on you know, every single box being ticked. You get a faster end-to-end -end process. Nothing beats walking across the room saying, could you sign this please? But that rarely happens, especially if you're involving other people. Um, sorry, other functions. So you know, I could walk over to you, but I can't, our finance guys are in a different country. So we get faster process, end-to-end. -end. We get early visibility of any shifts in the forecast. Um, where we've got lots of sites or functions, it's become particularly powerful because it becomes you know, more, uh, less difficult. We get a shorter period close. One of the sort of the soft sort of wins that people have, instead of having a two-week chase-up we talked about at the beginning where you know, we have period close, loads and loads of data crunching, trying to reconcile information, hope we get it right, hope we've got all the information. Have you been away? Oh, I can't get your data. I'll wait till you're back. Then we have some information. We should be able to, because we have one system and it's all live data and it's already been updated, um, we're... we're you know, we have a much shorter period end, which means we can take action. We can do it faster. We actually, we know where we are. Hooray. Um, we can do faster procurement. Now, one of the things, you know, I've noticed lately is a lot of changes now. The turf war I've always seen is that delivery and finance don't talk to each other, or they keep separate records and argue about who's right. Um, I'm often seeing now that the, 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 the cost data from the project is actually going back to finance. It's a two-way street now. Um, the projects are pushing forecast data back to finance so that they have that, that sort of outlooking value about you. We know where we are now. That's our role. We know where we're going. Um, but also they'll, the project will push back procurement data. So when we approve changes, it goes into SAP, for example, and that tells us what we can buy and gives us a purchase limit. And we, it sets our purchase value based on what's been approved. You get all the functions on the same page. Um, you can tell if there's not, you get reports to identify exceptions. But this is the thing, I've never seen it before. But now suddenly you have functions working in unison, using the same language, the same system, they're co-signing bits of paper. Um, and you want that because ultimately if a project 
sign something, finance have to pay for it. So why not get them agreeing that you know, months in advance, if not before? You don't have those separate signature pages. You don't have scanners, photocopies. Someone the other day even said they use a fax. You know, that's all gone. I haven't used a fax for five years. I'm a, you know, I'm a dinosaur. Um, and the big thing that people look for now is auditability, whether that's internal, regulatory, um, or by the government. Um, suddenly, you know, companies can stand by their process. Companies have ownership, responsibility. Somebody can say, yes, that's my change. I set it off. I signed it. I know what was in there. There's no sort of separate sets of data, hidden logs. And it means that people then can stand up proud and say, yeah, I'm happy to be audited. I can stand that now. I thought there was another slide, but there's a big question mark. Um, so I'll just stop. Um, I don't know how long I've been. I hope that was useful for you. Um, I'm happy to take questions. This is all I do. This is my day off. Um, I'll be back talking about it again for the next few days um, down at Canary Wharf. So if you have any questions, comments, experiences of your own, I'm happy to take them. I think we're about to get kicked out. Thanks very much. Thank you. Don't you want to push it? Anyone? Questions? <coughs> Nope.